So welcome to part one of our introduction to bioimage analysis. So in this part, we're going to look at the very basics of what is a digital image. We're going to discuss where the imaging data comes from with a particular example of fluorescence microscopy. We're going to talk about how images are displayed and in particular why histograms are a very useful way of looking at images. And then we're going to consider how you can make measurements using the popular open source software ImageJ. So the key thing to take away from this is that image analysis depends upon images containing trustworthy information. But rather inconveniently, images can very easily become untrustworthy and it's often hard to spot when that's happened. And so by the end of this, um, you will be in a slightly better position to be able to tell whenever images have been compromised. And certainly after the next couple of parts of the course, you'll know lots of ways to figure that out. And the reason why this is important, but also not very obvious, is that images can look the same but contain different information. And so I've shown five images here, but they should all look completely identical. But if you were to analyze these, um, perhaps looking at the size of the cell or the, the intensity, the brightness of the cell, then you get completely different results and often very wrong results. Whereas here at the bottom, I've shown images which look different. So the colors that display them are different, but they actually contain the same information. And so analyzing any of those would give the same results. And so in the legend here below, I've described what's happened to each image, which describes it, explains why it appears the way that it does um, or why it might be compromised. And these things will make a bit more sense as we move on through the course. But it's crucial to distinguish between the information in the image and its appearance. And this matters not only whenever you're acquiring images, but also when you're analyzing images. And so you need to be able to tell when an image is suitable for analysis or when it could be compromised and bad for analysis. The core part um, that we begin with is looking at the pixels of an image. So the pixels are basically the fundamental building blocks of your images, um, where the word pixel comes from picture elements. And each pixel has a numeric value. So here I've got an example of a particularly sunny looking cell. And if I select a region and I expand it, then you can see lots of little boxes and I've overlaid the pixel values in them uh, within the boxes just for display purposes. And the key thing that's important is the numeric value of the pixels, not actually how it's displayed. And so initially I was using little um, boxes which are shades of gray, but I could use little boxes which are shades of other colors. And as long as the numbers remain the same, I still have the original data. And then we could still make measurements and inferences from that data. So a natural question there then is where do these pixel values come from and what do they mean? And so the answer is going to depend upon the type of image. So I just want to give a very brief list of overviews of where they could come from for the specific case of fluorescence microscopy. And so I should point out that I am not a microscopist. I really just work with the images once they've been acquired. Um, so this is going to be a very basic um, kind of overview, but I think it helps give some useful mental models for thinking about images. And, and certainly ones that I rely upon whenever I'm looking to analyze a fluorescence image. So in fluorescence microscopy, the pixel values that we get um, depend upon how much light was detected. So for example, in this image of the cell, we've got an area where we've got high pixel values represented with lighter colors closer to white. Um, that indicates that more light was um, emitted from that part of the sample. Whereas there in the background outside of the cell, we've got less light. And so we've got darker pixel values in the, or lower pixel values in the end shown with darker colors. So now I want to consider briefly uh, where the pixel values come from in the context of fluorescence microscopy. And so what follows here is not the most anatomically correct depiction of a microscope you'll ever see. It's really a simplification, but I still find it to be a useful mental model. And there's lots of other resources online if you want to find out more about microscopes in detail. So I really only want to focus on three components. So there's the sample, the thing that you're looking at, there's the objective lens, and there's the detector. And so nothing in here is to scale or link together. And clearly there's lots of other components that you need to have a workable microscope. But these three are important to consider when you think about um, image quality and how images are formed um, from the point of view of analysis. And so we have the sample we care about. And then whenever we come to images, there will be light emitted from that sample. Some of it will go into the objective lens, some of it won't. And so then it won't actually contribute to the final image. But part of what does go into the objective lens can then be focused towards the detector where the image is actually formed. 
And so ideally, we would like um, the image that's formed in the detector to really give a perfect representation of real life. In practice, we cannot get a perfect representation of real life. It's even hard to define what precisely that would mean. Um, but the quality of the image that we really get, it's going to be limited by blurriness. And so this is the sort of diffraction limit. Um, it's going to be limited by the pixel size, which is a property of our imaging acquisition system. So the, the pixel size of the detector itself and noise as well, which comes from the fundamental limit um, from the, the nature of light. So we'll look at those things in a little bit more detail later. But the key point here is the images that we get aren't perfect. And so a lot of the effort that we have to go through when it comes to image processing and analysis is to try and compensate for the fact that we don't have a perfect representation of the thing that we want to measure. I'm going to say and zoom in and look in a little bit more detail at our detector. And so this is an incredibly simplified picture of what's going on, but I hope it will prove to be useful. And so you can think of the detector as being divided into little squares, and these squares can be called physical pixels. So not every detector is like this, but the ones we're going to consider here, um, you can think of the little physical pixels like this. And so we're detecting light, and typically with um, fluorescent microscopy, we're working with pretty low amounts of light. And so you can think of the light being detected in terms of individual photons that strike the detector, and then they will strike it at one pixel or another, and whenever they do so, they could give rise to an electron being released. Um, they won't necessarily do so, and that uh, relates to the quantum efficiency of the detector, but hopefully um, uh, you're going to get an electron whenever a photon strikes a detector, um, certainly with a um, hopefully a high probability indicating a high quantum efficiency, you should get um, lots of electrons whenever lots of photons strike the detector. And over the course of acquiring the image, you will have lots of photons fighting the detector according to responding to different pixels. And ultimately then we want to be able to get a sense of how many pixels were, or how many photons struck each pixel. And that can be done by quantifying the charge of the little electron clouds which were generated for each pixel. And then after this quantification, um, it's converted into a numerical value, which then gives you the pixel value in the image. And so the key point that I want to make here is that the pixel values in the image are not incredibly easy to interpret. So they are related to um, the quantification of the electron charge, which is related to the number of photons that struck the detector, which is related to the amount of light that was detected because it went through the objective lens after it came from the sample, but that's not all the light was emitted from the sample. And there can also be other conversion factors along the way. You could have a gain applying effectively a kind of a multiplication. Um, you could have an offset which is added to all the pixels. And so ultimately we end up with pixel values that are often said to be in arbitrary or intensity units, but they aren't directly counts of photons. Um, the relationship is more complicated and it's more complicated depending on the specifics of the imaging system. But what we can say is that the pixel value should have be related to the amount of light that was emitted from um, a corresponding region of the sample. And we can start to try and make inferences based upon relative differences between pixel values. So here I've got two pixel values. There's one is roughly twice as high as the other. And so we could say that it indicates about twice, twice as much light was detected in the lower pixel as opposed to the upper pixel. This is assuming that we don't have an offset, and so even this is not really a, a perfect um, thing that we can count on, but for, for now, um, it's going to help to give us an idea that whenever we make measurements, we need to be cautious in our interpretation, and we tend to have to make um, relative measurements across an image as opposed to trusting um, any particular number that we get as a pixel value as being inherently meaningful in itself. Um, but still, these numbers that are pixel values, even though they're pretty hard to interpret um, on their own, they are still our raw data, and we want to preserve them as well as we can, because when we come to make interpretations, we want to know that we are really working with the raw data, as opposed to introducing even more complexity along the way. Uh, and that's going to be a theme throughout the course. So anyway, once we have all of these pixel values, we need some way of displaying them. And a way to do that is by applying what's called a lookup table. So sometimes you will see this referred to as a color map, and it's basically the same idea. 
So the lookup table is essentially a table which maps our pixel values to colors which can be displayed on screen. And so here on the right, um, we have our lookup table. It goes from zero to 255, and we're gonna see later why that's a, an important uh, number um, for, for when we're working with images. But our lookup table is then giving us 256 different colors um, corresponding to entry pixel values between zero and 255. And so what the software displaying image is gonna do is gonna look at the pixel value, it's gonna to go to the lookup table, it's gonna find the corresponding color, and then it's gonna show a little dot of that color on screen. And so now I would like you to think about what could you do if you wanted to make the image brighter? Because you've really got two main options. One thing that you could do is that you could just multiply all the pixel values by two. That would give you higher values um, and then be looking at different um, entries in the lookup table, and that would give you an image that looks brighter overall. That can be problematic though. And in particular, because we have this limit of 255, which will be explained more next time, um, we can actually lose information because values which used to be different then become clipped to this 255 value. And so we don't actually know what two times the original value was because we get stuck on 255. But more fundamentally, in doing this, we only wanted to change the appearance of the image. And we really don't want to be manipulating our raw data for just a trivial reason like changing the appearance. So this is basically a bad idea. Changing our data just to get a different appearance um, can may impact our measurements later and it's hard to keep track of what exactly we've done. But the alternative is that we go back to our original um, pixel values here and we just change the lookup table instead. So here I've assigned um, many more entries of the lookup table to white and then redistributed the shades of gray I mean, it's what's left. And the end result is an image where we, it looks bright in exactly the same way as it did before, um, but has achieved that with while retaining the original pixel values and only changing the lookup table. And so that's a really crucial distinction to be able to make. So I'm gonna skip over here and show it to you in action in the ImageJ software. So here I've opened up ImageJ. If you're incredibly new to the software, it's important to know that you can always open an image just by dragging onto the toolbar. And that's gonna speed things up as opposed to going around and pressing file and open all that kind of thing. So what we have here is an image, um, which I use in the book for examples. And if we want to change the brightness and contrast, we can do this through image, adjust brightness and contrast, or we can use the shortcuts, um, shift and C. This brings up the brightness and contrast dialog. I can adjust these sliders, and then that will adjust uh, the image brightness and contrast. Actually, I tend to find it much more intuitive to adjust the minimum and maximum values as opposed to brightness and contrast, because this corresponds to really what you're seeing in the lookup table. It corresponds to what value is gonna get the, um, the color of the maximum entry in the lookup table, and which um, pixel value is gonna get the, the color of the minimum, and then the, the, the colors are gonna be distributed in between. So I find, tend to find that more intuitive. Um, particularly if we want to see, are there perhaps any details in the low pixel values that we don't see by default? So by default, um, our pixel, we've got black is shown as zero, um, uh, 255 is shown as white, and we can't necessarily see all of the details in the image because the eye isn't so incredibly sensitive to different shades of gray. But if I pull down the maximum, we lose the details in the brightest parts because they just saturate and become white but we are able to then see details in the background because we've got more shades of gray given to dealing with those details. And so playing around with the brightness and contrast is quite important for working with images in order to be able to see what's there, but you do not want to be changing your raw data. Um, and within ImageJ, you can see what the pixel values are by putting your mouse over um, any of the pixels. And then at the top in the status bar up here, you should see what the values are. And hopefully what you're gonna see is that the values are unchanged whenever I have modified um, the sliders in the brightness and contrast command. But what we were gonna see um, in a short period of time is that actually that's only if I modify the sliders but don't do anything else. If I was to boldly press this button called apply, then that will warn me that the pixel values will change if I press okay and if I do press okay, then 
ABJ has actually changed my pixel values and I can't get the original appearance back. And so be very wary about that apply option um, because it's often uh, quite a dangerous one and you want to avoid it. But I'll go back to the talk now and then we'll see some of these things repeated. So the lookup tables, I said that we could use it to display different brightness and contrast, but we can also use it to introduce colors within our, um, our image. So we don't just need to use shades of gray. Here I've got a lookup table with different um, colors. That's visible in image J under image lookup tables. There's a little list of ones that you might want to use. I made a terrible choice in that case, so I'll choose a better one. Um, it doesn't look terribly good because I've already messed up that image by pressing apply. So let's go to another one. And if I go to image, lookup tables, let's go with ice or again, I'm just making bad choices with these today. Let's go with fire. And we can see we now have a different lookup table and the same ideas of the brightness and contrast apply. But don't press apply. Anyway, um, so that's what we can see here. We can change our lookup table. It changes the appearance of our image. And we can make bad choices, as I did there in the demo, where you choose a lookup table that happens to have the same color for high and low values, and that's probably going to make interpretation more difficult. But that's actually not as bad as changing the pixel values, because you know we switch to a different lookup table to fix things, um, and you haven't compromised your raw data. So lookup tables can be helpful if you make good choices as to which ones to use. And the reason why ImageJ is very good um, for working with scientific images is that you have the ability to adjust things like the brightness and contrast without making changes to the pixel values, as long as you stay away from this slightly dangerous apply button. Um, back whenever I started, it wouldn't warn you that it would change the pixel values, now it does. And so if you're using a, a recent version of ImageJ from the last few years, at least you get a warning, um, but still, it's important that you know that you should heed that warning. But another good thing about ImageJ is that you can easily generate histograms from your image. And so the histograms that you get from the image will give you another view of the pixel values, basically show you the distribution of the pixel values and helpfully some extra statistics. And so this is very good if we want to be able to make sure that our pixel values are unchanged. So if I press um, H, actually that's not a terribly nice histogram, so I'll open a different image uh, to see it. So it's a slightly better histogram. So I can adjust the brightness and contrast. And after I do it, if I press H again, what you should be able to see is that my histograms are unchanged. The mean pixel values are unchanged. I've got some basic statistics simply by pressing the H key. And that is reassuring that I haven't done anything to mess up my data. But if I do press the apply button and I press H again, you can see that histogram has changed. The statistics have changed and I have indeed messed up my data. I do not want to see the changes there. And so the good thing about ImageJ is it gives you access to this kind of information. And so you can very quickly generate histograms, you can very quickly change the brightness and contrast, and it gives you the options of doing it in a way that doesn't modify your pixel values. If you were to open um, your image in some general purpose photo editing software, you might well find that it's not the case. And if you do do something like change the brightness and co contrast, it will automatically change the pixel values and there's no real way back. And so as we saw there, image histograms can actually be a more reliable way um, to assess whether the content of two images are the same or is the same. And so if I was to ask you what these, um, from these three images, which two have, are the same, contain the same data, if you weren't very skeptical and assumed it would be a trick, I think you would probably choose these two. Um, if you read into the fact that I'm asking you, it's presumably going to be a trick, you might assume um, another two, but it wouldn't be clear which unless you look at the statistics and the actual values themselves. And so here I've done that by generating histograms. And from that, we can see that these two images have identical histograms, which suggests that the only difference really is their different lookup tables. Whereas this image, although it looks identical to the one in the middle, uh, the image on the left actually it has been modified. And so you can recognize that in the different statistics. So the two on the right are the same and the one on the left is different. And so what I would now like to do is to just end with a few words on how you can make measurements within ImageJ 
um, because that is going to be something that if you do image analysis with MHA, you're going to want to do quite often. And so I showed you the histogram command, which you can bring up by just pressing H for histogram. There is a measure command, which you can bring up by just pressing M for measure. So if I go back to my image here, and if I press M for measure, I get some measurements made directly on the image. By default, I don't get a lot of measurements and they're a little bit sparse. And so it's given me the area of the image in pixels. It's given me the mean pixel value and it's given me the minimum and the maximum. If I want to get more than that, I can go to um, Analyze, Set Measurements, and then I have a whole list of other measurements that I could potentially access. One I definitely recommend turning on is Display Label. Um, but I'm going to choose the standard deviation and I could choose a few more. Um, I'm not going to do it for now, but uh, if you press help, you can get more information about what they mean. And so whenever I do that, the measurement table updates with extra columns, but it doesn't actually add in the measurements that I um, wanted for the existing image. I have to press M for measure again. And from that, um, I get a new set of measurements, which actually contains the ones that I now requested uh, that I wanted. So that's what we see here. And the reason why set label is so important is that if I open up different images and if I start to press M multiple times, um, I need this label here in order to be able to distinguish which image I've actually measured. Otherwise, it's not very clear. And so whenever you use um, image J, certainly for the first time, you should check out Analyze set measurements, choose the measurements that you're likely to want. And I would recommend you always turn on this display label um, so that you can see the image that you've measured in your measurements table. Um, and so the measurements table, it's really called a results table in MHJ. Um, it contains these various columns depending upon what you've requested. But something that's also important to know is that the measurements be can, can be constrained to specific regions of interest. Um, and those you can draw by choosing the toolbar buttons up on the top uh, of MHJ, um, or at least the ones on the left, the ones on the right tend to do different things, but the ones on the left are all dedicated to drawing regions of interest. And so the common abbreviation for regions of interest is ROI or sometimes ROI, as I tend to say without being able to stop myself. Um, one thing to be wary of though, is that if you draw a region of interest or a ROI, then it will, it can influence the measurements that you get within MHDA, but it's not necessarily obvious that it's done so because the results table doesn't actually tell you that you've re used a region of interest. And so here we can see that I have, well, I can show an action here. I'll draw a rectangle with the rectangle tool. I'll press M for measure. And we can see that I have a different measurement of the area because it's been constrained to this smaller area that I drew. Um, but there's no indication here that it was a region of interest. So I need to know what I'm measuring and I need to somehow keep a reference to it in my mind as to, to whether or not a region of interest was used because otherwise it's not um, possible to know directly looking at the results table. And I'm gonna cut that to get rid of it um, so that here we just have our recent measurements. You can also choose different tools in here and draw different regions of interest in different ways. If you want to get more detail, for example, a polygon tool can be good. Um, here we have, I think it's called an oval tool. Um, we can draw that as well. I think of it as really more of an ellipse, um, but you can right click on some of these tools as well to access more. So for example, we can uh, right click on this oval selection tool um, to get a different selection tool for ellipses or a different one for um, drawing with a brush, and that would allow me, for example, to draw just the head of the guy by um, painting on top of the image. And so right-clicking or double-clicking on these options can, uh, on these um, toolbar buttons can give you extra options. And once you have your results in a results table, ImageJ gives you extra commands that would allow you to create distributions of them, to look at them, and to generate histograms from the results that um, can be quite useful as well. A particular type of region of interest, which can be handy in some cases, is the line region of interest. And so I'm gonna go across here and I'm gonna draw a line. Um, if I hold down the shift key, it'll be constrained to be um, horizontal, vertical, or uh, diagonal. And then 
Using that line, I can go to Analyze and Plot Profile, or press the shortcut key of K, and that gives me a plot of the values um, across the line. I can even press the Live button, and then it will give me a dynamic plot that changes as I move the line across the image. And that gives us another way of getting a sense of what's going on with the pixel values. Uh, there is also the points tool, um, which you can explore up here in the toolbar. And there are ways that you can use it to draw individual points or multiple points. So here, I'll select the point tool. That's one point at a time. Unless I hold down the Alt key, then I have multiple points. If I don't, then I can, oops. If you say it's telling me exactly how I can get rid of them. But I can right click, I can choose the multi-point tool, and then I don't have to hold the Alt key. Um, and I will just add additional points uh, with the default settings. If I do hold down the Alt key and click on a point, then that will then remove it, if I am accurate enough. And so if you're doing any kind of counting um, with NMHJ, it's worthwhile becoming familiar with this um, counting tool, or the points ROI tool. And whenever you do this, if you press M for measure, then you can get a separate measurement for each individual point. So that will give you like the value under each pixel. Um, the area is zero because a single pixel isn't treated in this case as having an area, at least for the purposes of these measurements. And then finally, I want to say just a few words on what if you were wanting to have multiple regions of interest um, stored at the same time. So if I go back to my image, Whenever you draw points, it's not the easiest thing to get rid of them again. But I do want to delete them. So whenever I draw a region of interest in here, and I draw another one, um, basically I lose my original. Uh, if I want to keep it, then I need some way of storing it. And one of the ways that you can store it within ImageJ is you can add it to the ROI manager. So that's under Analyze Tools ROI Manager. Um, but I can also bring that up by just pressing the shortcut T, and that gives me a way to create different regions of interest in the image using perhaps different tools, and then I can go back and I can select them. I can also um, select them all at once, so by shift-clicking on them, I can press measure, and then I can get measurements of all of them at the same time. And actually, if I make my measurements in this way, I do get some information about the region of interest that I made. And so the ROI manager is a fantastically useful command. And there's lots of things in here that you can adjust, you can adapt properties, and you can use it to combine regions of interest um, as well. And so this is well worth exploring. But there is another way in which you can work with multiple regions of interest within ImageJ and that is to add them to an overlay. And so this behaves slightly differently. And so the ROI manager, it would give you a list. The overlay um, doesn't, but it keeps the ROIs on the image. So if I draw this, I go to image, overlay, uh, add selection. Image day will sometimes call a ROI a selection, sometimes a ROI, um, so just be aware that they are pretty much interchangeable, as far as I know. Um, and the shortcut key for this is B. Um, image has so many shortcuts that the letters involved are not always um, so obviously related um, to what we want because that obvious letter has been chosen for something else. But the shortcut for adding a region of interest to an overlay is B. And so whenever I do this, um, these regions of interest are on top of the image and I can click and hold to reactivate them. And you can tell that they come alive with these little handles that appear and I can move them around. Um, but if I make measurements, you may recognize this area from before, and that indicates that the regions of interest within the overlay haven't actually impacted the measurements. Only if I activate them, so that you can really only have one region of interest impacting the measurements at any one time, um, or you can use the ROI manager to cycle through all of them. Um, but if you have an overlay, that's really something that's used in image aid for display or for retaining your regions of interest, but it doesn't influence the measurements, it's only the active region of interest that does. 
and that may or may not be stored in an overlay. Uh, but if it isn't an overlay, you need to activate it in order for it to make a difference. So I would recommend playing about with this until you develop an intuition for what's going on, but also always test your intuition. And so if you're not sure if drawing, if you have a region of interest and you're not sure if it's on an overlay or if it's not on an overlay, um, you can maybe make measurements and then calculate does the area make sense for it influencing um, the measurement or not. Uh, and an additional thing to know about overlays is you can go in here and if you want, you can send them to the Roy Manager and then you can get the best of both worlds. And if you have them in the Roy Manager, then you can, for example, measure them all. And then if you close the Roy Manager, it will ask, do you want to save them as an overlay? In which case they end up back as the overlay. And so there's lots of useful tools and tips and tricks in here that you can learn as you go along. And some of them are described in the book as well. One last one that I want to give you um, before ending here is if you press L, it can bring up a command list. Um, it's called Command Finder. I think Command List might have been slightly easier to memorize with the L shortcut. Um, but basically, this is incredibly useful because then if you know that you want to find a command that's somehow related with an overlay, just start typing in. And then hopefully if overlay appears somewhere in the title or somewhere in the menu, you're going to be able to find which commands are available. Um, same for Roy Manager, for example, but it's a good way to help you find your commands. And also you can then double click to launch them from that as well. Okay. And so if you're using Fiji, you have the same idea, but it's called the search bar. So L will highlight it as well, and it will bring up uh, the options uh, here within Fiji. But it's the same idea of being able to search, and an image J is a command finder. And if you're using Fiji, but you would rather use the command finder here, um, there's an option under edit option search bar that allows you to choose uh, which one is going to be activated whenever you press L. So that's really it for part one. So to summarize then, images are composed of pixels and each pixel has a numeric value. When it comes to analysis, the pixel values are important, not the colors that they're displayed with that, with. that really comes from the lookup table. You can change the brightness and contrast without losing information if you only modify the lookup tables, um, but not every software is necessarily gonna do that if you change the brightness and contrast. So that's the reason why we're using image J here. Appearances can be deceiving though. And so you can have two images that look the same um, but contain different information because they contain different pixel values. Uh, and if you want to be able to do that, uh, be able to check if that's happened, uh, one way to compare the images is by looking at corresponding measurements or by generating histograms. And this gives them a convenient alternative view of the image and data. Okay, so I hope that was useful. Uh, that's it for part one. And in part two, uh, whenever I get around to recording it, we're going to start looking in a bit more detail about good images and bad images and other ways to assess whenever an image is suitable for analysis. Okay, thank you.